busy month. Um, it's an exciting month, and uh, we've got an opportunity to create a new us, so to speak. Uh, new Year's always seems to do that, and, and if you don't change, nothing really changes, right? If you don't decide to change, if you don't decide that you want to be a little bit different, then things really aren't going to change. It could be your mindset. It could be your your health, it could be uh, your work attitude, it could be your relational goals, whatever those things are, if you don't decide to change, those are. It has been pretty tough. And we're getting into this, this age of social media where it seems like everything that we look at, that we emulate, that we desire, that we envy, seems to be stuff that comes from social media. We look at somebody's life and go, oh, man, they got the greatest life in the world. And you look at the picture of this, this person, and they got 14 filters on the, the picture that they took, and they look great, and you don't necessarily know that. And here you are comparing yourself to them. And it's just a, it's just a crazy, crazy world. And so a lot of times when we, when we live our life out, we really have a bad self-image of ourselves. And I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but I think all of us can say that at one point in time of our life, especially over the last few years, we've had a bad self-image of our life. And today I want to talk to you about that image. I want to talk to you about the image that as we go into the new year that you have an opportunity to change. You have an opportunity to change the way that you see yourself, not the way that anybody else sees you, but the way you see yourself. Because I do believe that if you're, you're, you're self-image changes in your life, the image to other people will change as well. And so I want to I want to dive into this, and we're going to look at what God thinks about us. We're going to look at um, how we should uh, live our lives in spite of the rest of the world. And many of us have two different images when we look at ourselves. If you were looking in the proverbial mirror of yourself, I always say this all the time, like when I look in the mirror, I see the 18-year-old Jody. Like, uh, you know, he, he's fresh out of high school and uh, cut and ready to go and take on the world in college. And uh, that's not the image that actually everybody else sees. They see the old gray haired dude that's uh, out of shape and uh, not like, but that's not the way I see myself. My wife still sees me that way, but yeah. <clears throat> but um, that's not necessarily the look that I'm looking. So I get a distorted view of the mirror sometimes. And Ladies, you, you've done this before. I, I've watched my wife get ready, and, you know, there's a certain light where you're looking for that light, and you kind of, as you're putting on your makeup, you're moving this way and kind of looking back and leaning back, and you'll lean a little forward, and then you'll try to get that, and then all of a sudden it's like, there it is. You know, you kind of got that, that one little view that just changes everything, and so we have this distorted image that we have of ourselves a lot of times, and it affects the way that we live um, quite often, especially in a world that is telling you to look different, to be different, to look like, you know, everybody else. And there are certain people that you will never look like, okay? I, I know that I'll never look like Brad Pitt from the Fight Club. Like, that's always been my goal, like, just to have this. I, I know I'm never going to look like that, so I need to quit desiring that. But let me give you some d dangers of having distorted mirrors in your life. When, you, when you're looking at yourself, there's, there are a lot of things that are going to keep you from being the person that God has called you to be. When you're trying to, to be everything to everybody else and not be yourself, it will affect the way that you live. It will affect the way that you uh, live as a Christian. It will affect the way that you disciple. It will affect the way that you are discipled. It will affect many aspects in your life, and I want to walk through those. So, I want you to be very careful with these mirrors that can pop the way that I dressed and the way that, that I thought people would look at me and think of me differently. If I, you know, I had on really nice clothes and the most expensive stuff that I could possibly get and how I looked and my hair always had to be a certain way and uh, it always made me feel good. Now, the older I get, the less I could care less. You know, like I'm getting to that place where as long as my wife thinks I look okay, I don't care what anybody else looks like. The shirt my son gave to me, these pants are from Walmart, uh, the shoes were on sale, like I literally don't care anymore as long as I'm not running around butt naked. Uh, I just want to make sure that I have some clothes on. But I really don't care anymore what people think about me. Now, that used to be the life that I lived. 
you look at the world today, they really put a lot of effort on the way that you look. You look at the new addiction that is coming out now is um, plastic surgery. Like there are people who are spending millions of dollars, I kid you not, millions of dollars to have implants of everything that you could imagine. Bicep, back lats, um, thighs, butts, everything, like billions or millions of dollars on themselves to make them look different. And they have this, this worth that is set in the way that they look. Now, I can tell you, the older that you get, gravity does take over. It doesn't matter how much money you spend, eventually you're going to look like an old person. And that's starting to happen to me now. So my appearance, I have to be careful on my value, allowing my value to become how I think or what people think I look like. I shouldn't have to worry about that. I shouldn't worry about that. Now, social media has taken that to a new level. I, I want to warn you, be careful with your kids because it's going to affect them a lot more than it is us older people who are, you know, not near as involved in social media as our kids are. They are going to find their self-worth a lot of times based on social media. They're going to try to adhere or, or be like those people that are on social media, and it's going to be a scary place for them. Uh, you can see that now uh, just in your younger ones, so be careful with that because it's pushing it more and more. Social media will bring on this, this fakeness for people. Uh, it's not real life. Uh, it's not th the, the way that life is meant to be, but yet it's, it's moving further and further into that realm. So guard your children with that. Number two, the performance mirror. My value depends on what I can do. Again, this is something that I struggle. I'm, I'm basically confessing to you guys today since it's a new year. This is something that I str struggle with early on, especially uh, in my ministering and my, my, um, my pastoring uh, career. Like, it, I really struggle with performance uh, because I always thought that that's why people like me or that's why people would come to the church and... Um, you know, nothing hurt me any more than to hear somebody say, oh, man, you ought to listen to Pastor so-and-so. You know, the, his sermon last week was amazing, and it wasn't my sermon. But however, six months ago, I just preached that same message, and you missed it then. You know, now here somebody else is giving it to you. Like, I worried about that so much earlier on in my, Christian, or my Christianity and my pastoring that it really affected me. I started thinking that, man, I've got to put on a show instead of preach the gospel. And many of us do that, whether it's our work, whether it's our parenting. I mean, how many parents here, and you don't have to raise your hand, are uh, looking at other people's kids going, think, oh man, I wish I had those kids. Like, that's a performance issue. Like, you're worried about the performance that you're giving and that people are going to look at you in a different light because you aren't at certain uh, place. Uh, maybe it's your job. You know, maybe you don't have a, the, the, the job that you want or you know, you're, you're basing everything on performance. Um, your value does not depend on what you can do. I want you to understand that your value does not depend on what you can do. Now, God has given you a talent. God has given you a job. God has given you a position, whatever that looks like, whether it's in the home or out of the home. He has given you to, to do that in the best way that you possibly can. And that is in and through Jesus Christ. It's not... The position itself, it's based on what he, the talent he's given you on. So don't uh, let people, don't let people uh, value you depending on what you can or cannot do. Number three, the status mirror. My value depends on what others think of me. All of us want people to like us, right? Like we, we desire for people to, to like us. And a lot of times our status, whether it's uh, the position that you have at work or your financial status or uh, your position in the church, whatever that looks like, uh, we want people to, to like us in many cases. Um, that's a bad place to be too. Not that we want people to hate us, but our goal should not be to be so miserable that we're trying to make everybody in the world like us uh, just because we want them to think that we're in a position that uh, the, the status brings me up or, or uh, brings me to a place of respect. That's not a, a much of a value of any way. And so what I want to get to here today is that until we see ourselves as God sees us, we are destined to feel inferior. 
And there are many of us walking around today feeling inferior because of all of these things, all the worldly pressures that are coming upon us to, to, to make, make us think that we're ugly or we're not rich enough or we're not value, valued enough or, or, or our job's not good enough. All of these things just pile up on you. And over the last couple of years, if you think about how much free time that we've actually had, whether it's been in quarantine or maybe you got stuck in quarantine or the shutdown or lockdown or whatever, you've had a lot of time to think. Uh, I would guarantee that most people who are on social media, their social media times went up. And so we're looking at all this stuff that's bringing so much pressure on us and it's making us so depressed that we don't look at ourselves as God sees us. So what I want to start the new year off today is to give you an idea, the understanding of how God looks at you. Because to be honest, it doesn't really matter what anybody else thinks. It really doesn't matter how anybody else looks upon you. It matters what God thinks of you and how you think of God. And so when you start seeing God see you for who you truly are, that will bring your idea of yourself to a better place. That will bring the perception of yourself to a better place. It will make you more bold. It will make you more joyful. It will make you more uh, excited to be in the kingdom. And so I want to show you how we can do that. So I'm going to give you three key um, keys to biblical self-image. So this is where we have to get to. Number one, understand God's view of you. What does God think of you? Have you really taken much time to think about what God thinks of you? For me, all I have to do is go to the cross. That's how much God thinks of you, that he gave his only son to die upon the cross for your sins. Like, that right there should just take the cake on everything else. Whoever, whatever the world thinks of you, whatever people think of you, whatever you think of yourself, God thinks of you this much. He also did this. God made you in his image. In Genesis 1, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created him. Now think about this. You are created in God's image. The spirit that is in you is God's image in you. We're all different looking, but in the, in the center of us, us all is a soul. That soul is in the image of God, and you were created uh, by him and for him and like him. And that's, that's an amazing thought that the God of all creation thought of us so much that he would create us in his image. And that is a, a, a thought that sometimes passes us, that we don't really spend a lot of time pondering on, but he created us in his image. In the garden, it was perfection, okay? Now, because it's skewed, uh, because of sin, we now have the image of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit indwelled in us for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. God sent his son to give us the, the physical image of Jesus Christ. So we are created in his image. Number two, God loves you for who you really are. Now, before I go any further in this, God loves you for who you really are. God loves you no matter where you are right now. If you do not know Jesus Christ, he loves you just the same. When you give your life to you, he's not going to leave you the way that you came to him, though, okay? He doesn't want you to stay where you are. He wants you to, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's learning to not sin. That's learning to repent of your sins. And so don't anyone let you tell, ever let you, them tell you that uh, they can be whoever they want to be in God's, or in God's sight, because that's, that's not biblically true. They will change if they know Jesus Christ. God loves you for who you really are. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look up at, uh, at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as a man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, God doesn't really care what you look like. I'll just tell you that right now. It is all about the heart. And this is what Jesus was battling when he was here on this earth. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were coming and saying, look at all that I've done. And he'd be like, well, look at your heart, dude. Like, your heart is not anywhere near where it needs to be. Yeah, you keep some of the laws and you do this, but 
Your, your heart is not there. When Samuel was going to anoint David in, in those days, they were looking for a king that was going to be eight foot tall and as big as a house and to be able to take on anybody. And David was not that guy, but God knew his heart. And so that's how he chose David. What God is looking for in you is not your size, your looks, your ability, your checkbook, or anything. He's looking at your heart. Where's your heart when it comes to serving God, when it comes to loving God, when it comes to loving others? That's what he's looking for. He's looking for your heart. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, no, I'm sorry, let me go to the next point. God has taken up residence in you. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God literally lives in your body. He lives in your soul. And that should bring up your self-image, that I have the Holy Spirit living in me. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks of me. My image is not, my, my thought of my image is not based on anybody else. It's based on God living in me. It's based on His Holy Word. It's based on uh, the, the, the power that He's given me in, in and through the Holy Spirit. We've got to be really careful basing our knowledge or uh, status or any of those things and placing it above other. We have God living in us. And if, if we're going to follow Jesus Christ, our, 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 our model, our, the, the, the person that we're supposed to follow, we should be servants, the best servants in the world. Uh, like Jesus was. Most of us are trying to get there, aren't there yet? The third one here is God has made you into his masterpiece. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, for God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Man, you're a masterpiece. I mean, if you think about how the, 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 the body is created, like, it, it starts from the smallest of cells. Combined, the next thing you know, you have an embryo. From an embryo to a, a fetus, from a fetus to a baby, from a baby to a toddler, from a toddler to a young adult, from a young adult to an old man or woman. Like, that just to me blows me away. Like, that stuff just doesn't happen out of a cesspool of algae. Like, there has to be a creation. There has to be, a, you know, a creator that caused all of that to happen. And we know that to be God. You're a masterpiece. Like, there is nothing else that God cre created that would be better than, than us. Like, there's just the way that he created us. That's, he created the best of the best. There's nothing out there that's roaming the universe that's different or better or greater than us. We are his masterpiece. That should bring my self-image up. Number two. Believe God's view is true. Okay, so I told you all these great things that God is doing, and or, 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 it looks at you, and you're, you're his masterpiece, and uh, he thought of you, and he gave his son to die for you, but you have to believe that in order to make it happen. My drill sergeant used to say, if you look good, you feel good. If you feel good, you do good. And so we had to have all of our, 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 our uh, BDUs, man, we had to have them pressed. We had our Shoot, our boots spit shine like we had to come out ready to go even though we were getting ready to walk 15 miles and jump in mud and all this we had to come out looking good because if we look good we felt good and if we felt good we did good God is telling us the same thing he's like listen I, I, I believe in you I gave my son for you you created your masterpiece okay so that is who is in you now I want you to, to feel that I want you to believe that because when you believe that that's when you're going to start doing everything that he's called us to do. How would you respond to this, this question? Do you honestly believe that God likes you? Not just loves you, because theologically, God has to love you. Okay? Like, there, there are times in my relationship, um, Nan and I will get in an argument, and there will be this moment, you know, this, this quietness between us, and... Um, we're, we're trying to figure out and reconcile, and 
you know, one of us will say, well, I love you, and one, the other one will say back to you, well, I don't like you right now, you know, but I love you. It's almost like we have to love each other, but at this moment, we don't have to like each other, but we're going to get to that place where we do like each other, we love each other, and we, we reconcile that. God not only loves you, but he likes you, always. And we shouldn't allow our low self-esteem, the world, or anything to take that away from us. We need to believe that God created us as a masterpiece, that he gave his son to die upon the cross, that we are created in his image, because when we do that, man, that is exciting. That brings us to a place to where nothing can take away my understanding, my love, my desire to love and serve God when I believe that. And he loves you. He likes you. Many times when you hear a message like this, you're trying to figure out, okay, yeah, it sounds great, and man, Sunday afternoon's great, and then all of a sudden Monday morning comes in and slaps you in the face, and it's like, ah, here, I go back into looking in the mirror, and I don't like what I see, and no, you've got to take away that, that distorted mirror and start looking at yourself the way that God looks at you. James chapter 1, verse 23 through 25, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently is at the, excuse me, looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Now, one of the things that I try to teach quite often is application of the word. When you hear God's Word, when you read God's Word, it's okay to, to let it soak into you, to become knowledgeable about it, to memorize it, but until you start doing the Word, you're really missing out on the true form of Christianity. We need to be doing what God tells us to do. God says He loves us. God says He likes us. God said He created us as a masterpiece and in His image. I got, I've got to believe that. I've got to become the person that's going to be the doer of that. I, I'm going to walk in that. When people see me, they're going to know that something's different because I have God in me. That's what the church should be. That's the, the example of the church, that we should be out into the rest of the world saying, listen, I believe in God. I believe what it says. I, I, I love every word of this. And do I understand it all? No, but what I do understand, I'm doing. I'm living out to the best of my ability. That's what we all have to be doing. Look at key number three. Discover the real you. If you've been living under the illusion that you're unloved, unwanted, and not a valued contributor to this world and to the church, it's going, to little, it's going to take a little time to overcome that. I mean, think about where you've been mentally for a while. Many of us are trying to be something that we're not. Right? Now, none of us are perfect. Anybody in here perfect? Okay, none of us are perfect. Anybody here not sinned? Okay, we've all sinned. We all struggle. In men's ministry, I always tell men, you know, that we have five major problems. It's sex, wives, money, kids, and work. Like, that's how simplistic we are. Those are the only five problems that we have as men. And, but there's one problem that wraps around all of it is pride. And so in my pride, I don't divulge that I'm having an issue in one of these areas with a, another guy. So I think I'm the only guy that's going through this struggle or this issue. And many times when I've confessed or I've shared my testimony or, or, or just, you know, given an example of a struggle that I've had with my wife or kids or work or money or sex or anything like this, all of a sudden the, the guy's like, oh man, me too. And then another guy's like, oh yeah, I did too. And like this, this domino effect happens when we do that. Listen, there is nothing that you're going through right now that somebody else hasn't gone through. Don't think that other people are perfect. You know, when, when you, if you were to walk into somebody's house and you were to spend a month there, you would realize that they all have the same problem that you have in your house. Nobody is immune to problems or sin or issues. How we deal with them is different, though. 
As a Christian, I rely on Jesus. I rely on prayer. I rely on repentance. I rely on my brothers and sisters to help me get through those trials and tribulations, no matter what you're going through. I have to discover the real me in this process. What's, what's going to help me get through the issue? What's going to help me feel better? What's going to help me look through that? And after being a Christian for 17 years, I've got those things down a little bit. Now, some things pop up, and I've got to feel and, and, and figure those out. But all in all, I kind of know the real me now. I've, kinda, I, I've got that kind of figured out. Many of us need to do this. We need to give others what we need. I want you to look at this passage, um, and it's often uh, wrongly connected with money, but Luke chapter 6, verse 38, give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. In this context, Jesus is talking about forgiveness. And many times what you and I need to be doing is we need to be giving what we need. First of all, we need to give forgiveness to anybody that's in our lives. We need to give love to the, anyone that's in our lives. We need to, especially if it's, if it's not something that you're getting now. You know, a lot of times we want, uh, especially in marriage, we want something from our spouse, but we're not giving it to them whether it's love or respect or time or any of those things. We need to be giving what we want. If there's something in your life that is lacking right now, give it. You know, some of the best moments in my life are when I'm serving. You know, when I'm serving other people, when I'm uh, giving my best to somebody else, whether it's in my family or the church or somebody out in, uh, in, in society or our community, man, that moment that my selfishness goes away and my selflessness kicks in, uh, I get everything that I wanted at that moment. Like the feeling that I need and, you know, the, 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 the importance of doing something or, or feeling like I'm actually contributing is when I am not selfish, when I am serving. And this is what Jesus was teaching the whole time he was here. Like, you know, the, the apostles are fighting about who's going to be the greatest apostle, and Jesus is like, dude, y'all are missing it. Seriously. You got to be, you got to be a servant. You got to be behind the scenes. You got to, you, you know, I will elevate you. You let me elevate you. Don't try to get to that place. Man, when that happens, when my selfishness goes away and my selflessness kicks in, I start getting everything that I need. What we're going to present to you in a few weeks, it's going to require selflessness. What I believe God is calling the church to do is going to require selflessness. We're going to have to give what we need. And the Lord's Prayer it says, give us our tras- or forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Many times our lack of forgiveness comes back as lack of forgiveness from God. You think about that. Think about that verse. In other words, he's going to forgive me as I forgive others. So in my heart, I need to learn how to start forgiving others. I need to learn because I want that to come back. If I want love, I need to start learning to give love. If I want respect, I need to start learning to to give respect. And those things will come back to me. The next part is use your God-given gifts and talents. There are certain things that you can do better than no one else. Everyone is a 10 in some area of their life. Do you understand why Jesus calls the church a body? It's because without certain parts of the body, the body just doesn't function 100%. And so in a church, we need 100% of the people serving in some sort of fashion. Like, literally. And right now, um, statistically speaking, I would say most churches are at that 80-20 rule. we got 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. And we need everyone to step up and use their God-given talents. There are certain things as a pastor that I can't do that you can. And there are certain things that you can't do that I can. 
and vice versa. If you look at somebody sitting to your left or right, that person has a gift that supersedes what you can do and should be used for the kingdom. There are certain things that, like, I should not be in children's ministry. I love my kids, but, you know, like, I cannot be in children's ministry. God knows that I should not be in children's ministry. Um, There are some of you that love kids and want to be with them. You should be in children's ministry. Youth ministry, I've told you my youth story about the youth. As a youth leader, uh, I kept dreaming about becoming 16 years old so I could beat one of them up at one point in time. So I knew that youth ministry wasn't that. The youth ministry needs help. Uh, There are some of you who are talented with writing or curriculum. We need help there. There are some of you that have talents with computers and um, internet and all that kind of, we need help there. There are some of you who have um, uh, serving gifts. We need serving. Some of you are really gifted in stepping out into the community and know people in the community. We need you. Okay, going into 2022, we're going to ask a lot of you, and I don't mean we're going to waste your time. We need to be serving the kingdom of God more and more than we are. Romans 12, 6, since we all have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Now, Paul goes through all of these gifts, prophecy and teaching and uh, serving and giving and Like, he just lays out all these gifts, but we need you to step up into your gift, because here's what happens when you step up into your gift in the church. Your self-image changes, okay? I've told this, I've said this a million times, you cannot get involved in the life of the church on Sunday mornings. You just can't. You're going to feel like a stranger, you're going to feel like a you know, like nobody loves you because you walk in at 10 o'clock, we sit down, we sing. Uh, the next thing you know, 1130, you walk out the door and nobody said hi to me. And I'm mad now, you know, and the sermon stunk and the music stunk. And now I'm mad at everybody. And you can't get to know the church, but you can get to know the church through serving. You can get to know the church through small groups. You can get to know the church through the Bible studies that we do. We want you to get involved into the nucleus of the church. When that happens, guess what? Life begins. Life reproduces, as a matter of fact. We start, you start telling your friends, and you start telling the community, and the next thing you know, your small group's growing, the church is growing, uh, our excitement's growing, our unity's growing, and, and life just starts happening at that, at that time. A good life. Because statistically, most people are about 50 percenters when it comes to Sunday morning. If you think about throughout the year, how many times you'll miss church on Sunday morning? You know, 26 times, that's 50 percent. And that's about the average for most churchgoers. It's about 50 percent of the time on Sundays. However, small groups, there's about 85 percent attendance. For small groups. So small groups, I mean, people don't want to miss a small group. They get involved. They love, they join the small groups. And it will, I promise you, help your self-esteem. It will help your visual of yourself. And as we go into 2022, again, nothing may change in your life but your mind. And that's a great place to start. How do I look at myself? How do I know that God looks at me in a certain way? Well, I'm, I'm going to get to know God. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to fellowship with the believer more. I'm going to learn to share the gospel more. I'm going to do these things that God is calling us to do that's going to help me build my, my courage, help me build my boldness, help me build my servitude. And I'm telling you, when we start serving and we stop looking for a pat on the back, everything that you were looking for will come back at you. There's a, there's a, a spiritual um, awakening that happens when we're serving other people, especially those who need it, when we're serving each other, out-serving. That's our goal, to out-serve each other, whether it's in worship ministry or tech ministry or children's ministry, youth ministry, discipleship ministry, outreach ministry, whatever that is, we want to out-serve each other. And those things will come back to us. Now, I want to end with a story to 
kind of wrap all this together. There's a, in a cup of coffee at the Soul Cafe, it's a book, Leonard Sweet tells a story of making a film by two Londoners. In 1971, they begin the, to film street people. The film captured their daily rituals of homeless, their trials and joys. Some were drunk, others mentally disturbed. Some were articulate, others were unintelligible. One of England's leading composers, David Breyer, agreed to help with the audio aspects of the film. During his work, he became aware of a constant undercurrent of sound that appeared whenever a certain homeless man was filmed. At first, the sound seemed like muttered gibberish, but after removing the background noise, Breyer discovered the old man was singing. Briars learned that this beggar didn't drink or socialize with others. The old man was alone, filthy, homeless, but he also had a sunny, uh, sunny de uh, demeanor. What distinguished him from others was he was he was was his quiet singing. He would for hours sing the same thing over and over. The man's weak voice was unstrained, but it never wavered from pitch. He repeated the simple phrases of a song over and over. One day at the office, the composer looped together the first 13 bars of the homeless man's song, preparing to add orchestration to the piece. He left the loop running while he went downstairs to get a cup of coffee. When he returned, he found his fellow workers listening in subdued silence, and a few were even weeping. The old man's quiet, trembling voice had leaked from the recording room and transformed, transformed the office floor. And here's what he's saying, and the words are from an old hymn. Jesus' blood never failed me. Jesus never failed me yet. Jesus' blood never failed me yet. There's one thing I know, for he loves me so. Most people would look at an old homeless man like this and wonder, how could he possibly have a good self-image? But he had, he'd come to a place where old images are shattered and new images are created. He had come to the cross, to Jesus' blood, and discovered that God has proved that he was worth much more in his eyes by sending his son to die upon the cross for his sins. While everything externally cried out loser, the cross provided that he was a winner in God's eyes. You see, he did what we all need to do. We need to come to the living waters of God's grace and be made whole. And that's where we have to take our mind. We have to take our mind to the cross. We have to take our mind to the day that God himself came in the flesh, willingly walked upon the cross, and died for our sins. And because of his shed blood, you and I are saved from God's wrath, eternal damnation in hell. That ought to bring me to a place to where I'm joyful, where I'm happy, where I am this world is not going to bring me down anymore because I know where my hope lies, and my hope lies in heaven because of the cross. Whether you're a homeless man or you're a rich man living in a castle, that cross is for everyone. And you can be just as miserable as a rich person as some homeless people are, or you can be as grateful as a homeless person as a rich person can be as well. But it all depends on how you view yourself and who you view yourself through. We all have a purpose. And that is in Jesus Christ. Our, our purpose is to build the kingdom while we are still here. And that kingdom is the church. The church was established for us to go out and take care of our communities, to go out and take care of our, our country, to go out and take care of the world. And hopefully we can get you to start seeing that the kingdom is, is much more than just ourselves. When we start focusing on ourselves, I promise you, the world becomes really, really small. When we start focusing on others and we start focusing on the cross and we fo start focusing on uh, expanding the kingdom and building the kingdom, oh my goodness, it's a great big world. And we need everyone in the church to help. We need everyone in the church to serve. We need everyone in the church to be reading their Bible. We need everyone in the church to be praying. We need everyone in the church to be repenting. Because when we get to that place, we become unified because now Jesus is the center of the church. And Jesus is the reason that we're going to go out into the community and try to establish him as the center of the community. The image that God made you in is his own. 
And sometimes the only way that people are ever going to see him is in and through you. We should not have salty Christians. We should not have depressed Christians. We should not have Christians that are just, you know, making the world shun us and not come, want to come to the church. We should be the bright and shining light that's out there. And it's all going to be on how you view yourself. Do you view yourself as a child of God? We are children of God. Like that ought to wreck your world. Like God, I, when I'm dead and gone, man, I am right next to Jesus. I'm in heaven. I'm talking to the apostles. I'm meeting Jesus. That's going to be exciting. Don't let the worries of the world bring you down. Don't let the viewpoint of other people bring you down. Don't let social media bring you to a place where you think nothing. Listen, if you if you have a roof over your head and you've got five bucks in your account and you've got, you know, electric and heat and food in the refrigerator, listen, you've got 99% more than a lot of people around the rest of the world. Even our poorest, those that are on welfare making $15,000 a year are in the top 95% of the, or top 5% of the richest people in the world. Isn't that crazy? Many people only live less than a dollar a day. Our self-image is not based on the stuff that we have. Our self-image is based on who we have, and that's Jesus Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit indwelled in us. You are a child of God. Don't ever let that slip your mind, and don't let the world tell you differently. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your Son who died upon the cross for our sins. Lord, as we step into this new year, Lord, give us a a new us, Lord, mentally, physically, whatever, whatever that is, Lord. Let us just become something new something greater for the kingdom. Uh, Lord, let us be servants. Lord, let us be a bright and shining light out into the community, a world that is just dying to have some purpose, to, to, to feel loved, to feel wanted. Lord, let us be um, that for them. Lord, let us be joyful in all that we do. Let us not worry about the struggles of the world. Let us uh, just focus on you. Lord, let us love your word. Give us an insatiable desire just to read your word every day. Lord, let us, let us just apply that to, um, to ourselves, to our families. Lord, even to our work, let us be bold in that. I look forward to what you have in store for Ignite Church in 2022. For my family, Lord, for uh, each one here, Lord, just, just move, move us, Lord. Don't let us become complacent. Let us not focus on the wrongs, Lord. Let's just focus on the blessings that you've given us. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that does not know you, Lord, that you'll just start prompting them to to finally give up and say, I believe. I believe in your son, Jesus, who died upon the cross for our sins. He was buried, resurrected, and he's coming back one day. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.